as an environmentalist, I say to myself, the best possible news would be some mega emergency which got rid of huge chunks of the human race. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I'm basically, if, if, you, if you said to me, who is right in the argument, the no growth people or the let's go for growth people, I would certainly say the no growth people. But I'd add as a corollary to that, you have to get population under control as well. Because if you look at it in sheer economic terms, how can you sustain increases in per capita income at a time when you have rising population without rising economic growth? Whereas if you have a declining um, population, which is what I would aim for, then of course even a stable economic growth situation will give you increases in per capita income. So that's where I stand on do, that. Do you, do you have a sense of what the carrying capacity of Britain is or of the, uh, uh, of the world as a whole? Or? Well, Britain, I put it at 10 or 15 million. Um, I, mean, <laughs> I think that'd be absolutely fine. I mean, that would do us really splendidly. At, at, at a limit, 2025, I think it's complete nonsense that we are now confronted with an islander, would you believe it, of 70 million, 70 million people. I wrote a paper, I think it's the only paper the Conservative Party has ever published, and it was published as an old Queen Street paper in, in June mm. 1972, oddly enough, and it was called uh, Britain Needs a Population Policy. And, um, and you, you could still argue that today, I mean, right now. I certainly could, I certainly could, but what has happened, of course, is that we have all been, as it were, shunted aside, off, shunted off course by what you might call the rise of political correctness, because you can't talk about this now without being saying you're anti-feminist, because you're telling women what to do with their bodies, or you're racist, because you're saying it's the browns and the blacks and the yellow races who mustn't have, um, uh, or you're left-winger, because you're really trying to get at you know, the capitalist society. So it's a very, very difficult one now. And I would say that at the very least, uh, the governments of the world have to start talking, the government of this country has to talk, uh, start talking seriously about immigration. Because if you look at the rise in Britain's population now, you will see that, as it were, there is a really serious differential in the fertility of the immigrant population to the fertility of what you might call the indigenous population. So anyway, but this is, this, this is, this is very political stuff, not one for Guardian readers. <laughs> <laughs> And now, Mr. S uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I should like to make a statement on the, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, yeah. better known as COP26, which took place in the magnificent city of Glasgow over the past two weeks. It was the biggest political gathering of any kind ever held in the United Kingdom. 194 countries were represented. We had around 120 heads of state and government, 38,000 accredited delegates, and there were countless tens of thousands more in the streets and parks and venues outside. It was a summit that many people predicted would fail, and a summit that I fear some quietly wanted to fail. Yet it was a summit that proved the doubters and the cynics wrong, because COP26 did not just succeed in keeping 1.5 alive, it succeeded in doing something no UN climate conference has ever done before, by uniting the world in calling time on coal. Yeah. In 25 previous COPs, yeah. all the way back to Berlin in 1995, not one delivered a mandate to remove so much as a single lump of coal from one power station boiler. For decades, tackling the single biggest cause of carbon emissions proved to be as challenging as eating the proverbial elephant. It was just so big that no one knew quite where to start. But in Glasgow, Madam Deputy Speaker, we took the first bite yeah. because we have secured a global commitment to phasing down coal and, as John Kerry pointed out, you can't phase out coal without first phasing it down as we transition to other cleaner energy sources and we have for the first time a worldwide recognition that we won't get climate change under control as long as our power stations are consuming vast quantities of the sedimentary super polluter that is coal. That alone is a great achievement but we haven't just signalled the beginning of the end for coal, Madam Deputy Speaker. We've ticked our boxes on cars, cash and trees as well. The companies that build a quarter of the world's automobiles 
have agreed to stop building uh, carbon emission vehicles by 2035. And cities from Sao Paulo to Seattle have pledged to ban them from their streets. We've pioneered a whole new model, uh, an intellectual breakthrough that sees billions in climate finance, development bank investment and so forth being used to trigger trillions from the private sector to drive the big decarbonisation programmes in countries like South Africa. And we've done something that absolutely nothing, that absolutely none of the commentators saw coming by building a coalition of more than 130 countries to protect up to 90% of our forests around the world. Hi folks, Boris Johnson here. I know quite a lot about improving air quality in London. I've brought in a lot more cycling, I've brought in new hybrid buses, I've brought in green electric taxis. And that was even before we brought in the ULES, the ultra low emission zone, for inner London. By 2030, all new cars in this country are going to be much cleaner and greener anyway. Though today he said all that would change thanks to a new law being rushed through Parliament. We are uh, making sure that we have new powers to uh, distrain, to take people's, uh, to take people's assets, to take people's, uh, to take people's assets. Look, on this point, on this point of language, you've got to understand that sometimes you need to get a point across. Now, at this particular point was actually Boris saying that you know he'd been a bit late for Charles Moore's book launch you know and he works for the Telegraph Charles Moore works for the Telegraph you don't expect people who work for the Telegraph to be late for each other's book launches anyway but the real point <laughs> Boris said the real point Boris said was he absolutely supported the objectives and if you look at the PC if you look at the piece he wrote in yesterday's Evening Standard if I may mention the Evening Standard here I'd like to well he struck a strong note, for example, on the extinction of wildlife. That, by the way, is totally linked with your climate change objective, because one of the ways you can deal with climate change is by preserving habitat. You know, these are the, these are the great carbon sinks. Stanley, you, you actually, uh, listen, you're, you're always a compelling political commentator. You went viral this week uh, in an interview clip in which you said that uh, limiting the amount people fly or having, having a, a, a sort of an allowance of air miles was, was the plan. Um, well, say, to elaborate on that. Well, it's absolutely clear to me. Here you have a, a, a sense, taking, taking the conclusions of COP, that the way we are way be, belong, be, beyond trying to get to the 1.5. The odds are getting 1.5 would be a fantastic achievement. There's no doubt about it that in the end, the nations of the world, the sectors of the world, will have to say, look, we've got to have plans in energy, in transport, in agriculture, in food, in consumerism. And how are those plans going to be divvied up in the end? They're going to be divvied up because by agreement we say, yes, we do have emission reductions, which we're all going to stick to. And if that means, you took the example mm. I gave it, of flying, if that means that actually um, we have to somehow, you know, as a country, say, look, here we have the global av aviation, and we know that's producing, I think, is it 3% of total emissions now? We need to get that down. Then the countries between themselves are going to have to say, look, actually, we're all going to have to take the hit in this one. Mm -hmm. And how do you spill that down? You spill it down somehow. Now, how you actually are, are rationed out is another matter. I mean, in the end, you certainly don't want people flying in individual private jets, you know. Or, uh, but might, might we all have a carbon allowance well, in which if, if we've heated the house too many days of the year, we've driven our car too much, we can't fly away on holiday? Could, there, there could well be. I mean, there is a thought. that there Do, do be we want to live in that kind of world? And who decides well, how much we get? Well, if you want to have a world to live in, that's the route you may well have to do. You see what I mean? This is what we're trading but off. But the, the elite will still get their holidays and their flights, won't they, and their second homes? Uh, they may or may not, but you might still have a world to live in. And at mm. the moment, at the moment, the, there is no doubt about it that some serious measures have to be taken in lots of these scenarios. Now London is to get the first ultra-low emission zone. 
Boris Johnson has announced radical plans to impose new restrictions on all vehicles driving in central London. Put very simply, we want to set a timetable for when most of the vehicles, almost all the vehicles coming in to central London will be at or near zero tailpipe emissions. So they'll either be electric or plug-in hybrid or something like that. And, and uh, w one of the things you could obviously do is set a deadline for all new vehicles to be uh, like that by 2020.